shows everybody that you haven't contributed to that error as recently, so you're not as valuable as that person in skinny heels next to you, or more likely in some ad, is to keep us buying new shoes. Advertisements and media in general plays a big role in this. Each of us in the U.S. is targeted with over 3,000 advertisements a day. We see more advertisements in one year than people 50 years ago saw in a lifetime. And if you think about it, what's the point of an ad except to make us unhappy with what we have? So 3,000 times a day, we're told our hair is wrong, our skin is wrong, our clothes are wrong, our furniture is wrong, our car is wrong. We are wrong, but it can all be made right if we just go shopping. Media also helps by hiding all of this and all of this. So the only part of the materials economy we see is the shopping. The extraction, production, and disposal all happens outside of our field of vision. So in the U.S., we have more stuff than ever before. But polls show that our national happiness is actually declining. Our national happiness peaked in the 1950s, the same time that this consumption mania exploded. Hmm, interesting coincidence. I think I know why. We have more stuff, but we have less time for the things that really make us happy. Friends, family, leisure time. We're working harder than ever. Some analysts say we have less leisure time than any time since feudal society. And do you know what the two main activities are that we do with the scant leisure time we have? Watch TV and shop. In the U.S., we spend three to four times as many hours shopping as our counterparts in Europe do. So we're in this ridiculous situation where we go to work, maybe two jobs even, and we come home and we're exhausted. So we plop down on our new couch and watch TV, and the commercials tell us, you suck, so you've got to go to the mall to buy something to feel better, and then you've got to go to work more to pay for the stuff you just bought. So you come home and you're more tired, so you sit down and you watch more TV, and it tells you to go to the mall again, and we're on this crazy work, watch, spend treadmill, and we could just stop. So in the end, what happens to all the stuff we buy anyway? At this rate of consumption, it can't fit into our houses, even though the average house size has doubled in this country since the 1970s. It all goes out in the garbage. And that brings us to disposal. This is the part of the materials economy we all know the most because we have to haul the junk out to the curb ourselves. Each of us in the United States makes four and a half pounds of garbage a day. That's twice what we each made 30 years ago. All of this garbage either gets dumped in a landfill, which is just a big hole in the ground, or if you're really unlucky, first it's burned in an incinerator and then dumped in the landfill. Either way, they both pollute the air, land, water, and don't forget, change the climate. Incineration is really bad. Remember those toxics back in the production stage? Well, burning the garbage releases the toxics up into the air. Even worse, it makes new super toxics. Like dioxin, dioxin is the most toxic man-made substance known to science, and incinerators are the number one source of dioxin. That means that we could stop the number one source of the most toxic man-made substance known just by stopping burning the trash. We could stop it today. Now, some companies don't want to deal with building landfills and incinerators here, so they just export the disposal, too. What about recycling? Does recycling help? Yes, recycling helps. Recycling reduces the garbage at this end, and it reduces the pressure to mine and harvest new stuff at this end. Yes, 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 we should all recycle, but recycling is not enough. Recycling will never be enough for a couple reasons. First, the waste coming out of our houses is just the tip of the iceberg. For every one garbage can of waste you put out on the curb, 70 garbage cans of waste were made upstream just to make the junk in that one garbage can you put out on the curb. So even if we could recycle 100% of the waste coming out of our households, it doesn't get to the core of the problem. Also, much of the garbage can't be recycled, either because it contains too many toxics or it's designed not to be recyclable in the first place. Like those juice packs, where they have layers of metal and paper and plastic all smushed together, you can never separate those for true recycling. So you see, it is a system in crisis. All along the way, we are bumping up against limits. From changing climate to declining happiness, it's just not working. But the good thing about such an all-pervasive problem is that there are so many points of intervention. There are people working here on saving forests and here on clean production, people working on labor rights and fair trade and conscious consuming and blocking landfills and incinerators, and very importantly, on taking back our government so that it really is by the people and for the people. All of this work is critically important, but things are really going to start moving when we see the connections, when we see the big picture. 
when people along the system get united, we can reclaim and transform this linear system into something new, a system that doesn't waste resources or people. Because what we really need to chuck is that old school throwaway mindset. There's a new school of thinking on this stuff, and it's based on sustainability and equity, green chemistry, zero waste, closed loop production, renewable energy, local living economies. It's already happening. Now, some say it's unrealistic, idealistic that it can't happen, but I say the ones who are unrealistic are those that want to continue with the old path. That's dreaming. Remember, that old way didn't just happen. It's not like gravity that we've just got to live with. People created it, and we're people too. So let's create something new.